praise the Lord. It is good to see you in the Lord's house today. I want you to take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Luke's Gospel chapter 19. I've been gone for really just one Sunday, but for two weeks. Do I look any different to any of you? I've never preached with a beard before. I just got to tell you this. I've, I've grown vacation beards before. I've never preached with a beard before. I told Michelle, I said, I don't know if I can do this or not. I, th- I said, I think I need to shave it off. She said, preach with it. You'll give people something to talk about at lunch today on Sunday. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, we'll at least have it for today. I'm glad to be back. And hey, I think we're all glad to be back because we had to, to cancel services last week because of the water main break. Are you glad to be back in the Lord's house? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in this place, and I'm glad to see you here. We've got a number of teams that are today uh, out on mission journeys, really all across the country and all around the world. Many of our young people and our, our students are away on a mission trips this week, and we're just praying. I'm praying that God would use them in great and mighty ways, and that God would use them to share the gospel on these mission journeys, but then also that God would speak to them and work in the lives of our students and others who are on these trips. Because I really believe when you're on a mission trip, and I've experienced this so many times, when you're on a mission trip and you're praying and you're depending on God and you're sharing the gospel and you're ministering in the name of Jesus and you're just doing that day after day after day, you just open yourself up to hear God speak to you and to direct your life. And I'm praying that God would do something great in the lives of our students this week. So please be in prayer for all those mission trips that are going on uh, in the days uh, that that are happening right now. Just be in prayer for that. Then I also wanna let you know, next May, Michelle and I are looking forward on on leading a tour on the journeys of Paul. We're gonna be going to Italy and Greece and Turkey and seeing some of the places where Paul visited on his missionary journeys. We're going May of 2024. We've just got the brochures in now with all the itinerary and all the details, all those things are available. And you can see those brochures at our welcome desk today. So if you go by the welcome desk, you can get more information about that Journeys of Paul, Paul tour coming up in 2024. Right now, I want you to take your Bibles. Let's look in Luke chapter 19. I want you to stand with me as we read God's word together. Luke chapter 19. And today I'm talking about the story of Zacchaeus. We're talking about learning big lessons from a little man. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 1 of Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead And climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood And said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of God. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, we love you. We praise you. I thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of worshiping you and declaring that you are our living hope. Jesus Christ, we praise you and we thank you. Now, Lord, I ask in these moments that you would move me out of the way and God, speak a word to your people in this place today. And Lord, we just pray that we, you would, we would hear your voice speaking to us for we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And brothers and sisters, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. There's something about the story of Zacchaeus that just captures our attention. We learned the story when we were kids. How many of you know the song that we learned when we were kids about Zacchaeus? I'm going to give you opportunity to sing it before the message is over. I promise we'll stop and we'll see if we can't sing that song together. It's just a story that captures our hearts. 
I read that when Charles Spurgeon was operating his pastor's conference or pastor's college in uh, London back in the 19th century, and by the way, Charles Spurgeon, it's almost impossible to even describe what an influential, influential preacher of the Word of God Spurgeon was. He preached in London every Sunday morning, every Sunday night to standing room only audiences, crowds of 5,000 or more morning and night. They published his sermons all over the world. Even to this day, there is no writer more published in all of the English language than Charles Spurgeon, an incredible ministry, an incredible preacher. But he had a pastor's college. And one of the things that he did is he trained these young pastors. Every Friday, there was an oak tree on the property that he would go to and have all of his students in the pastor's conference gather around and, uh, and they could ask him any question they wanted to ask. And then he would point to one or two or three of them and assign them a passage of scripture and on the spot have them preach an impromptu sermon for the rest of the students. It was just part of what they did every Friday. And so this particular Friday, they were at this oak tree and, and he had answered the questions and then he pointed to one of his students and it was a, a, a guy who was smaller than most of the other students at the pastor's conference. He pointed to him and said, I want you to come up and preach a sermon on Zacchaeus. No preparation, nothing done ahead of time, just preach a sermon on Zacchaeus. And so this student got up and here's what he said. He said, Zacchaeus was small of stature and so am I. He said, Zacchaeus was up a tree and so am I. He said, Zacchaeus came down and so will I. And so he went back and took his seat and everybody just applauded, including Spurgeon. Just something about the story of Zacchaeus that captures our attention. I want to talk to you about six lessons that we can learn from Zacchaeus as we look at this passage today. What kind of man was Zacchaeus? First of all, the Bible tells us Zacchaeus was a bad man. A lot of times we don't think about that in the children's story or the children's song that we learned about Zacchaeus, but Zacchaeus was a bad man, and we see that in verse 2 of the text. The Bible says, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now, his name was a great name, but the name Zacchaeus in the Hebrew language means righteous or innocent. So his mom and dad had given him a great name to live up to. He just didn't live up to his name. His name meant righteous or innocent. But he was not anything close to being righteous or innocent. We see that in the next phrase in this verse. The Bible says he was a chief tax collector and was rich. That tells us everything we need to know about Zacchaeus' character. It tells us he was a bad man. You see, in those days, the Roman Empire, in order to raise funds, charged taxes for all of the territories that they had conquered. And the Jewish people especially did not want to pay those taxes. They didn't want to give to a secular pagan government. They didn't want their tax dollars going to fund the pagan temples where the Romans worshipped false gods and goddesses. And so it was hard to get the Jewish people especially to pay their taxes. So here's what the Romans did. They would contract with certain people among the Jews and they would say this, okay, here's the tax we want you to collect but you can charge anything you want to above that and keep that for yourselves. And so that's what Zacchaeus did. He would charge what the Romans said, but then he added his own extortionary fees on top of the taxes and he collected that and he did whatever it took to collect those taxes. He would threaten, he had thugs that he would send out to beat up people in all likelihood. He did anything he could do to collect those taxes. And he must have been very good at it because the Bible says he wasn't just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. Luke's gospel talks a number of times about tax collectors. Zacchaeus is the only one who is called a chief tax collector. That means he not only collected taxes, he had other tax collectors out doing his dirty work for him and beating people up and threatening and doing whatever it took to take money from people. And we also know he was successful at it because he was rich. He had made a lot of money as a tax collector. I don't even know how to quite explain to you 
what it looked like for Zacchaeus to collect taxes in those days. We think of, of tax collection as, as something that the government does, but tax collectors are, are usually wonderful people. My first job when I was in high school, I worked for a summer at the city tax office, and I worked around the city tax collector. He was a great guy. He was a public servant. He was doing everything he could to, to just do his job and to help take care of the taxes for the city. But Zacchaeus wasn't a, a public servant. He was a public menace. In fact, I, I think about a mission trip that I took several years ago to El Salvador. And while I was there, I learned that in El Salvador, especially at that time, if you got a cell phone call and the number came up without telling you who the person was and you didn't recognize the number or recognize the person, you didn't take that call. And it wasn't just because you weren't interested in talking to that person. It was dangerous to take that kind of call. Because here's what would happen. You would answer that call from an unknown number and they would say, you owe taxes. Now, it wasn't the government calling. It was just some thug, some gangster calling. But this is how they would say it. You owe taxes. And if you don't pay your taxes of $100 a month, you're going to get killed. And they knew your number and they knew who you were. And it was serious business. One week that I was in El Salvador, Patty, the pastor's wife at the church where we were serving, Patty got word that her brother in Guatemala had gotten murdered because he had gotten one of those calls and he hadn't paid what they called the taxes. Well, that, that's the kind of tax collector that we can think of when we think of Zacchaeus. Not just a public servant, not just somebody doing his job for the government, somebody who would do whatever it took to take money and to extort money from other people. He was a bad man. Now, the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was a bad man, but you know, the Bible tells us all of us are bad people because the Bible says we've all sinned. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As I was thinking about that verse of Scripture this week, it's a familiar verse, but just thinking about it in terms of Zacchaeus, we know that Zacchaeus was a short man, but the Bible says we all fall short. When it comes to God's standard of holiness and perfection, when it comes to God's glory, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may have never stolen something from someone. You may have never threatened someone or bullied someone, or you may have. But regardless, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's standard is perfection. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that high up in the ceiling of this worship center, there's a mark there. There's just a mark there. And imagine that the goal is for someone to jump up and touch that mark. Now, I, I did a little bit of research this week and found out that in, in, in NBA history, the two highest vertical jumpers were Michael Jordan and uh, a, a, another player, uh, last name Griffin. Let's see if I can find his name in my notes. Some of you may know, a guy named Griffin. Griffin, and it's not Ray Griffin. Griffin and uh, Michael Jordan, two highest vertical jumpers. Daryl Griffith is his name. I said it wrong. Daryl Griffith and Michael Jordan, both of those guys can jump 48 inches. All right, so they can jump almost, or right at four feet. Four feet, 48 inch vertical jump. That's them, here's what I've got. Ready? That's all I got. Now in my defense, I didn't have a running start and I'm wearing my church shoes, but that's about all I got. That right there. All right, so there's a mark in the ceiling that I've got to meet, I've got to jump up to. Now imagine I'm standing here, Griffith is standing here, Jordan is standing here. All of us have the job of jumping up and touching that mark. Here's what I got. They can put 48 inches between the soles of their feet and the ground. But can I tell you something? Not one of us, not one of us is going to be able to reach that mark up there. You may be here and you think, wow, you know what? When it comes to my moral life and my spiritual life, I'm doing great, but can I tell you something? You don't meet God's mark. No matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, we all have this in common. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That was Zacchaeus. He was a bad 
man. But then something else about Zacchaeus that we see in this text, he was a desperate man. Zacchaeus was a desperate man. Look in verse 3 of the text. The Bible says Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. I don't know why. Maybe he had heard that Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners. He was known for, for eating with and spending time with people that nobody else had any use for. He, he hung out with tax collectors and sinners. Maybe he knew that. Or maybe Zacchaeus even knew a former tax collector named Levi, who we often call Matthew. And the Bible tells us that Levi or Matthew was at his tax collection stand charging his exorbitant prices for taxes as people were coming by. And Jesus walked by and told Matthew or Levi, get up and follow me. And he left behind his tax stand and followed Jesus. Maybe Zacchaeus knew that about Jesus. Or maybe Zacchaeus was just tired of the guilt of his own sin and dissatisfied with the money that he had and the riches that he had, and he realized there was more to life than that. He was a desperate man. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. Here's what the Bible promises. When you seek the Lord, you'll find him. When you seek the Lord, you'll find him. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The Bible says when you seek the Lord, you'll find him. But you've got to be desperate enough to seek him. Stop right here. Listen to me on this. Don't miss this. There are some of you in this room and you're saved. You know you're saved. But you're trying to find your satisfaction in something or someone else rather than Jesus. It will never satisfy. I read a study this week, a Harvard psychologist, her name is Ashley Willens, and she did a survey of some of the wealthiest people in the United States. She, she surveyed thousands of people who have net worths of $10 million or more. And here's what the question was, she asked. Do you have what it takes to be perfectly happy? And 75% of these people with net worths of $10 million or more, 75% of them said no. And then she asked, what would it take for you to be perfectly happy? And they said, between five and 10 million more dollars. Well, what were they thinking about? Here's, here's what she said. She said they were paying attention to what other people had. They got their eyes on what somebody else had and they thought, if I can just get that, then I'll be satisfied. At the end of her study, she said, it doesn't take a PhD in psychology to see how misguided that is. And yet a lot of people are thinking, if I can just get the next thing, just a little bit more, whatever the next thing is, a little bit better position or a little bit more money or a little bit more recognition or a little bit more pleasure, whatever the next thing is, and yet you keep coming up unsatisfied. Here's why. There's an empty place in you that only Jesus Christ himself can satisfy. And until you're desperate for him, you're going to wind up unsatisfied by everything else. Zacchaeus had a measure of power. He had a measure of prestige, at least among the other tax collectors. He had a lot of money, but he was seeking, look at it again in verse 3. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on the account of the crowd, he could not. Nobody was going to let him up to the front of the line. Nobody was going to say, Zacchaeus, come stand next to me. He had stolen from them. He had threatened them. He had hurt their families and their friends. And so he was so desperate that he ran out ahead and he came to a sycamore tree. Now, if you go to Jericho even today, 
you'll see in one of the parks, and I've seen it a number of times, a sycamore tree. They used to have a sign on it there. They don't have it anymore. There used to be a sign, I've seen it, that said, this is the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus climbed up. It's not really that tree. But it's a tree just like it. The sycamore tree has a short trunk and then lots of limbs, and you can almost climb up it like a ladder. It doesn't take much to get up on the first limb, and then you can just sort of go up from there. And so that's what Zacchaeus did. He was seeking the Lord. He was a desperate man. When you seek the Lord, you'll find him. And not only that, when you seek the Lord, you discover he's seeking you. That's the third thing I want you to see about Zacchaeus. Number three, Zacchaeus was a significant man. Zacchaeus was a significant man. Look in verse 5 of the text. The Bible says, When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus stopped and looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, come down. Now, at this point in time, we can't go on any further in this sermon without stopping and singing the song. Y'all ready to sing the song? Y'all know the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. You get extra points if you do the hand motions as we sing. Y'all ready to sing it? Let's sing it together. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that day, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus You come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. You did a great, great job singing that. Really, really good. Now, the thing I love, that's great, awesome. I want you to think about that song. Think And think about what the text says. Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus thought that he was searching for Jesus. Jesus was looking for him. He saw Zacchaeus. He sees you. He, see, he, sees, you, he, he sees you right where you are. He sees maybe the emptiness in your life right now. He sees you. But then not only did he see Zacchaeus, he knew Zacchaeus. He stopped and he looked at him and he said, hey, buddy. That's not what he said. Hey, buckaroo, that's not what he said. Hey, guy up in the tree, that's not what he said. What did he say? He said, Zacchaeus. He knew his name. I was preaching to a group of children one day, talking about the story of Zacchaeus. And uh, I came to this part of the story, and I asked a rhetorical question because I forgot you don't ask kids rhetorical questions. They answer. And so I asked the question, How did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? And when I said it, hands shot up all over the auditorium. So I stopped, and there was a little boy, maybe kindergarten or first grade on the front row. And I said, okay, how did did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? His answer was, because he's Jesus, he knows everybody's name. He knew his name, Zacchaeus. He knew him. And I imagine that when Zacchaeus heard Jesus call him by name, he thought, well, if he knows my name, He knows a whole lot of other things about me. He knows what I've done. He knows what people say about me. He knows me. Jesus saw him. Jesus knew him, but but don't miss this. Jesus wanted him. And that's the one place that the little song that we learned as kids doesn't quite get what the Bible says. Because in the song, Jesus says, I'm going to your house today. That's not what Jesus said in the text. Notice what Jesus said in the text. Jesus said, I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus, hurry down. Because I must. I've got to do it. You can't stop me. This is on my list of things to do. You didn't even know it. I must stay at your house today. I not only see you, I not only know you, I want you. The same thing's true for you. God sees you, Jesus knows you, and he wants you. He wants you for his own. One of the beautiful truths of Scripture 
is that God chooses us. And there's a mystery in this because from our perspective, when we get saved, we decide to trust Jesus as our Savior. And, and there is that, that element of our responsibility in calling on Jesus and asking to be saved. But the Bible is so clear in saying that long before we were born, long before the world was ever created, God chose us to be saved. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 6, He chose us. God chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. God saw Zacchaeus. Jesus knew Zacchaeus. Jesus wanted Zacchaeus. I want you to see one other thing about, or one uh, next thing about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a loved man. He was a loved man. Why did Jesus say, I, I've got to stay in your house today? Because he loved him. Look in verse 7 of the text. The Bible says, when they saw it, they all grumbled. I don't know who they all were. It may have been everybody there. I, I think it was certainly the, the religious people. We'll see in just a moment. They were always grumbling about this, about Jesus. When they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. You can see the sneers on their faces and hear the snarl in their voices as they say it. He, Jesus, has gone in to be the guest of this man that everybody knows is a terrible sinner. Everybody knows what this guy has done. If you turn a page or two back in your Bible, you'll see that that was something they said about Jesus all the time. They were always complaining that Jesus was a friend of sinners. In Luke chapter 15, verse 2, the Bible says, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. You know, that there's nothing meaner. There's no one more hateful than a self-righteous religious person who doesn't really know Jesus. And that's who these Pharisees and scribes were. Man, they had everything lined up. They had all of their morality and all of their standards lined up like little tin soldiers. And they thought that God stood up and saluted every time they walked past. They thought that they impressed God by who they were. And when they saw someone who didn't meet up to their standard, they looked down on them. And when they saw Jesus hanging out with notorious sinners like Zacchaeus, they grumbled, they complained. He has gone in to be the guest of the man who is a sinner. I, I know that they said that as a word of criticism against Jesus, but just look at those words again in verse 7. And remove the snarls and the sneers and the grumbling and the complaining and the self-righteousness. And just look at those words that they spoke because even in their anger, what they said was true about Jesus. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Aren't you thankful that Jesus receives sinners? Aren't you thankful that he would make himself the guest of someone who's far, far from God? You know why Jesus does that? Because he loves Sinners. He loved Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a loved man. Our world is looking for people to love them. Sinners need someone to love them, not to lash out in anger at them, not to look down with condescension at them, but to love them. A man in our church told me about something that happened here in Oklahoma City just a couple of weeks ago at the Grace Rescue Mission. And my friend told me, he said, I found out that the Grace Rescue Mission, in addition to a lot of the other things they do, one of the things they do is that they feed people who are living on the streets in tents, deep in places where even law enforcement are hesitant to go in because it's just so violent, so dangerous. 
gunfire day and night, drug deals going down all the time. Some of the toughest people that you'll find living on the streets. And he said every day, several times a day, the Grace Rescue Mission feeds these folks. They just have sandwiches for them. And they come out and they'll line up to get sandwiches. And he said, you know, they told me you can't go down to the places where they are. It would be very dangerous to go down where they are. But they come up to get the sandwiches. He said, so he decided just to, to stand in line and to see if, if he could pray with some of the people who were waiting in line. And he said one day, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a guy who came up. He was standing in line waiting to get a sandwich. He said everything about this guy said he didn't want you to mess with him. He said his head was shaved. He said he was, this what my friend told me, he said he was short, so I'm preaching on Zacchaeus, I'll just bring in that detail. This guy was short, head shaved. He said it, his neck was covered all the way up to his face with gang tattoos. And uh, he was just standing there waiting to get a sandwich. My friend came up to him and said, hey, how you doing today? He said, fine. And then my friend asked him, would it be okay if I prayed for you? The guy said, okay, go ahead. And so my friend began to pray for this man waiting in line. And he prayed the gospel over him. As he prayed, he prayed and said, God, thank you for loving this man. Thank you that Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for the sins of this man. Thank you, Lord, that you promised to save this man if he calls on the name of Jesus and Trust Jesus to forgive him of his sin. And I pray, God, that you'd show your love to this man today and bless him today. And he prayed in Jesus' name, amen. The man just stood in line, went on up, got his sandwich. He was walking across the street. He got across the street. And when he did, he turned around and called out to my friend. He said, hey, hey, thank you for praying for me. I really needed that there's a whole broken world all around us and that brokenness expresses itself in all kinds of different ways but here's what this broken world needs they need the love of Jesus and Jesus has sent you and me somewhere he's going to send us somewhere this week to simply show the love of of Jesus Christ and to share the love of Jesus Christ expressed in the gospel because he loves them. The Bible says he goes in to be the guest of those who are sinners. Zacchaeus was a loved man. The next thing I want you to see about Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a changed man. Zacchaeus was a changed man. Look in your Bible now in verse 8 of the text. The Bible says, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. I want you to notice how much Zacchaeus had changed. One thing that shows that he had changed, he calls Jesus Lord. You're my master. I know enough about you, Jesus, to know that you're my master. You're my boss. You're the one I need to follow. Lord, the half of my goods I give to to the poor. And notice he says that in, in present tense. He doesn't say one day, sometime in the future. No, he says right now, beginning right now, I'm going to give half of everything I have to poor people. Man, this is a guy who had defined himself throughout his life by taking from whoever he could take from and keeping it for himself. He says, I'm going to give half of it away to the poor. And then out of the other half, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, and, and don't miss the language he was using here. The word if there does not mean there was a possibility. It means there was an absolute certainty. That's the word he was using. Since I have defrauded people of things, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. If I've taken anything from people, and I know I have, I'll give them back what I've taken. I'll give them four times what I've taken. That was a changed Man, if you had been at that table at Zacchaeus' house and you had heard this guy who had threatened and, and stolen and blackmailed everything he could do to get people's stuff, and he's saying, I'm going to give every, half of what I have to the poor and I'm going to restore fourfold from anybody I've taken from, you would have heard him and said, that cannot be true. But listen, 
Jesus will change you in ways that almost seem untrue. Ray Anderson, who's our pastor of evangelism and missions here, he and I were riding in the car across the city a couple of weeks ago. And I just love to ask people, how'd you come to know Christ? And so I asked Ray, Ray, how'd you come to know Jesus? And he told me the story. I loved his story. He said, I was a teenager. He said, people have been sharing the gospel with me, but one particular time I was at the church in our community. Someone shared the gospel with me. I prayed and received Jesus Christ as my savior. I know I was saved. He said, the first thing I wanted to do was call my mom. He said, because I've been doing all kinds of things to cause my mom grief. And he said, I wanted to call my mom and tell her I'd gotten saved. He said, I got on the telephone. He said, I called her. She answered. I said, mom, I just trusted Jesus as my savior. I've asked him to give me his gift of eternal life. He has saved me. He said, my mom said, don't you lie to me. (laughs) Why? Because from her perspective, that just couldn't even be true. That, that's how they must have felt when they heard Zacchaeus say, I'm going to give half my money to the poor, and then I'm going to restore anything I've taken four times. <laughs> Zacchaeus, we don't know about that. No, but Jesus knew. Because not only was Zacchaeus a changed man, Jesus bears witness. Zacchaeus was a saved man. Look at the last two verses. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house since he, Zacchaeus, also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus didn't just turn over a new leaf. Zacchaeus didn't just decide to become a better person. But that's not what Jesus offers. Jesus doesn't just offer you a chance to to decide to do better. Because on your own, you'll never do better. Zacchaeus was a changed man because Zacchaeus was a saved man. Jesus says salvation has come to this house. That's God's gift of salvation. That's God's rescue of of someone who is headed for hell and God's judgment eternally. Salvation has come to this house. And he says, that's why I have come. He says, the son of man, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. A saved person will be a changed person. I'm about to finish things up in just a few moments, but I, wanna, I, want you to, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I want you to look into your own heart and ask yourself this question today. If you say you are a saved person, are you a changed person? There are a lot of people who say they're saved, but there's no change. They just keep on going the way they were going before they said they were saved. Jesus never saves someone without changing them. If there's no change, there's no Jesus. There's no change in your life, there's no Jesus in your life. But when Jesus saves, Jesus also changes. He lived about 250 years ago. Some people say his name is pronounced William Cooper. Some say it's pronounced William Cowper. He spelled it C-O-W-P-E-R. I've been told by historians that he pronounced it Cooper. William Cooper wanted to die. He, He had become convinced that the best thing he could do for God was just to take his own life. And so he had made plans. He hired a carriage to take him to a certain place on a river in Yorkshire, England. And there at that spot, he had picked out the spot, he was going to jump into the river and die. And so he got in the carriage and the carriage took him to that place that he had picked out. And when he got there, William Cooper discovered that there was someone sitting on the banks of the river at that very spot. And so he said, I can't jump in there. That guy will jump in and try to save me. And so I can't, I can't do it here. So he went home and he decided that he was going to take his knife and fall down on the blade of his knife and take his life that way. He fell down on the blade of his knife. The blade broke, broke off 
didn't go into his skin at all, again, he had failed. He said, I'll get some rope. And there's a rafter here. And I'll hang myself here. He got everything ready to hang himself. The rope broke in three places. By then, he had really messed himself up just trying to do himself. And he had to recover from all the things he had done. And during that recovery time, God spoke to William Cooper and showed him he wanted him to live. And even more than that, showed him that Jesus Christ would forgive him of his sins and give him a new life and save him. William Cooper trusted Jesus as his Savior, and later he wrote the words that we sing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. Sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Jesus saves and transforms. And the same Jesus who saved William Cooper, the same Jesus who saved Ray Anderson, and the same Jesus who saved Stephen Rummage, and the same Jesus who saved Zacchaeus will save you. Because he came, look at it, He came to seek and to save the lost. 